Hello, and welcome back to the Artist Forge live today on Creativity. So glad to have you with us today. Let's welcome our other hosts, Matt Stagliano and Bassam Sabah and Becca Bjorki. Hopefully, Becca will be on her computer soon, so she'll be able to chat a little bit better with us. But that's okay. We're all here together. That's what's important. Say hi if you are in the audience today. We want to know who is hanging out with us. Say hi in the comments. Uh, just a reminder, if you haven't, you do need to give StreamYard permission in order to use your username. So Facebook friends, that way we know who you are. So don't forget to do that if you haven't, but say hi. So we can say hi to you. We will share your comment live up here on the screen. I'm sure we've got some friends out in YouTube as well. So if you're there, type in a comment. We'll be able to share it. Also, we have Cicela with us this morning. Hello. Hi, Cicela. And Trish has joined us. Fantastic. Yes. I know we have more friends. My husband just closed the door. He's like, I don't want to hear whatever this is. <laughs> Quietly. Click. <laughs> Um, so, oh, see, we've got a Facebook user. So who, who is our friend? No, we don't know. Let me head over there and see if I can keep track of you guys in Facebook land as well. Write another message with your name in it, please. Who was, let's see. <clears throat> I don't know who it is. <laughs> got to keep track of you guys. All right, so um, while we're waiting for friends to say hi and let us know that they're here, I have really loved our discussions this week so far because we've been talking about things. Oh, it's Jacqueline. Hello, Jacqueline. Hello. There we go. Um, we've been talking about things like where you get your ideas from and how you develop them. And then, of course, today we talked about creativity, which is one of my favorite subjects. And those things, of course, all really play well together because you have to have the idea and be creative and then take it and turn it into something that you can create. Um, and I am really curious, what do you guys like? Has there been anything that really stood out to you this week in the conversation as far as um, creativity or where you get your ideas from, how you develop them, like all of that stuff? This goes for you in the audience today as well. Has there been anything that really stuck out to you about our conversations on creativity? We also have Sally with us. I think the thing that stuck out to me this morning, especially, was just the simple fact that storytelling is everything. It's ubiquitous, right? So whether you're trying to describe orange without using the color orange, um, or you're coming up with an idea, um, you're trying to figure out how to put an elephant in a balloon, like whatever it is, there's got to be um, some aspect of storytelling to that part. And I love that part of it, right? We we're talking about smells and taste and touch and and sight and all the all the senses and how you know, your brain will always come up with a solution to the problem. No matter what question you ask it, it will always answer it in some way, shape or form. So whether that is like you said, your mom was carrying a washing machine up a flight of stairs, <laughs> which still intrigues me to no end. Um, but the fact that there's got to be some aspect of storytelling to it that can really spark your creativity to go down paths that you didn't think would be there before. So, um, yeah, I really like that aspect of it, that no matter what we do, it always comes back to story. Yeah. I think that's one of my favorite things. It's amazing to me how, how much the ability to tell stories, the desire to tell stories <clears throat> in general is intertwined with what it is to be human. Um, the way that we think is in stories, the way we make meaning is in stories, all of that. And it's just, really incredible to take even something that seems super abstract, like this idea of, um, I mentioned this morning, you know, like, how would you visually create what the color pink sounds like? Like, that doesn't seem to make any sense. And yet, if you were to do it, you still would do it by talking to yourself and telling yourself stories about, well, what does this color mean? And what does it feel like? And how does it affect? And, you know, all of that stuff. So I'm, I'm with you. I'm always blown away by the power of stories. Well, you know, the, the other interesting thing from the discussion this morning is I think I think I mentioned maybe at the beginning of Clubhouse, like last year sometime, that 
I've got a level of synesthesia where my senses are crossed, right? So I hear in color. And so when you're trying to say like, what does pink sound like? I'm like, I know exactly what it sounds like. Um, so Explain. There, well, it's, it's hard to. Um, it's more you hear the sound and I see a color rather than I see a color and hear a sound. Okay, right? okay. So I think it's why I'm able to identify and play a lot of music by ear is just because I can see patterns and see trends in color. It, I don't know. I, I don't know how to explain it. I thought everybody could do it. So the interesting thing for me is I love how our senses trigger each other to think of different things, right? So people associate smells with orange or smells with black or, you know, sounds with pink. Like, I love how our brains cross all those wires and we're able to immediately relate to what you're asking. What does pink sound like? Oh, let me tell you, you know, I just, I love the, the, the way that it goes down those paths. Yeah, me too. Um, I want to say, want to say hi to Olga really quickly. She is with us today. Hello, yeah. Olga. And to Kelly. Hello, lovely Kelly. Hey. So glad that you're here. Um, as you were saying that, Matt, I was thinking about when I was younger, when I was in high school, like I think right before my freshman year, I had a really, really tough experience with anxiety. Just an event happened that was so wild. I didn't know how to process it. And I think that was the first time I had felt the, the kind of gut wrenching anxiety, you know, where it feels like your, your stomach is full of snakes and it's just twisting in on itself. And I remember at the time telling my mom that I felt green and not like green, like growing plants green, but green, like that sickly putrid color green. And to me, till this day, anxiety feels green. And um, my mom, my mom, so she'll ask me that sometimes she's like, are you feeling green? And that's, you know, for some reason it makes perfect sense in my head. And you're right. The way that we, the way that we experience things is, is not singly, you know, there's a, a smell and a taste and something that you can correlate for some reason in your mind. And I think being able to explore really cool concepts that way just forces you to think in, a, in ways that you never would have before. Kelly says that pink definitely smells like cotton candy. I can see that. Bubble gum too, like bubble gum. Matt, my husband has some synesthesia as well. He can tell me where the days of the week are in relation to his body, wow. not in an order that's logical to me. Of course, that is so crazy. Man, I thought I was getting to know Matt. Now I have to rethink a few things. No, yeah, well, you should rethink a lot of things, Bazaar. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, Cicela says pink smells like beach roses. Paint drips. Paint drips and bubbles. Paint drips. I like it. Yeah. So, uh, so I had I uh, I really enjoyed the days also, and you know we talked about the intention, and we talked about the audience. I think that's an important part. Like when you consider the audience you're targeting with your with your image or your painting or whatever, it, it can make all the difference. But one thing that I'm still thinking about since this morning, uh, when we started talking about what uh, I don't know what you called it, the compositionally what it would mean, or yeah, or, yeah, and then we talked about uh, you know, what does that color represent or what does it evoke, right, in terms of emotions? I have a small PDF uh, or a PDF that I use with my clients for personal branding, and I do have a page on color, right, that talks about, you know, basically what to wear and what, you know, what does your color, what does a color represent? And I went back and I looked at orange, right? And here's the, the, the different things that it represents, right? So it says optimism, independence, adventure, creativity, fun, enthusiasm, and productivity productivity right so that's i didn't invent those that's why i looked those up but what's interesting is like the way this is done is for us to tell our customer you know if you wear a red orange uh, sorry an orange dress this is the type of emotion it'll evoke or that it'll represent and then i was thinking about working it backwards since we're working in black and white it's not that simple working it backwards because i can have i mean how do i show optimism or independence or adventure. Right? I mean, I can do all that in a, in a or some of it, maybe adventure and, and, and so on. But how would people interpret it as being orange and not black or red or blue? Or, because it, it doesn't mean anything backwards unless you actually know this theory inside and out. So I'm still, sorry, I'm kind of upside down on this. Like, how would I represent optimism to bring out orange in the viewer's mind in a black and white image? as an example. That's kind of a third level of complexity, 
right? Or any of those. So yeah, I'm still, uh, I, I, I was screwed up all day. Because of that. <laughs> I'm sorry, Basav. That's okay. Um, no, it is, it, it really does, it forces you to, to reconsider not only the way that you think, but what you're actually trying to do. Because if you weren't here for our talk this morning, I asked everybody if you had to photograph the color orange without using any color, like if you had to photograph in black and white, how would you communicate the color orange? And we talked about the fact that um, Matt mentioned luminosity, like maybe putting several objects together that have different luminosities so that orange, which is kind of a mid tone, depending on, you know, if it's lighter or darker, but so that really stood out. People talked about using different objects that are orange. So, you know, um, oranges and pumpkins and fall leaves and all of these different things, putting those together to try to communicate. We talked about writing the color orange on the wall and taking a photograph of that. We talked about things like sunsets and um, even then getting, obviously, as Bassam just mentioned, really into like, well, what does the color orange mean is energy and optimism and liveliness and all of this stuff and warmth. And so how would you take those ideas and then photograph those ideas um, that are related to orange to try to communicate? And I think, Bassam, with your question just now, it's really interesting I don't know that you have to make the color orange appear in somebody's mind to communicate the deepness of what orange is. And I know that that sounds completely stupid, but, but when you think about a word like love, right, there's many different kinds and different ways that love can feel. You're never going to get the whole of love across by showing a picture of a couple kissing. You're never going to get the whole of love across by showing a mom holding her baby. It expands far beyond that. And I think something like orange is way bigger, too, than just the light bouncing off of that particular pigment. It's the way we react to it and the way it makes us feel and the things that we see and our relation to it in the environment and all of this stuff. So I don't think we even have to necessarily say the color needs to appear in somebody's mind to still communicate orange, if that makes any sense at all. Uh, well, it, it does make sense. And I, I didn't really intend to say that the color has to appear in the person's mind. But right. the whole purpose right. of the exercise today was to represent orange, either the color orange or orange. So how do you bring out orange, whether it's the color itself or the feeling, but by, by showing confidence in a photo? I mean, what is the link between the two? There, there is no link. If you succeed at showing one of those emotions or bringing out that emotion in, a, in an image, I can associate it with blue as much as I can with orange. I can associate it with yellow or pink or, or, or so, so, so making a direct link is not obvious versus having an orange in the picture or, or, or showing a sunset or. Sure. But I, I wonder then if the importance is the success of communicating to the viewer or the success of communicating your feelings about it to the viewer. Like, if, I'm, if I don't get paid unless somebody walks away thinking orange, okay, then that maybe is one thing. But if my goal is to use that creative exercise to force myself to think about, well, how can I communicate this in a complex way, or how can I make these connections? How can I help somebody else feel what orange feels like to me? Yeah. Even if they don't quite get where I'm going, they don't necessarily have to. Does that, I'm, I'm not, I know I'm yeah. not gonna make any sense with this. Well, the only reason it doesn't make sense to me, I mean, I see what you're saying, I totally get it. The only reason it doesn't make sense to me, because to me it was, it, was a, it was an exercise. Right. Please communicate, how would you communicate orange in an image that's black and white? Right. And all I'm saying is when you when you use objects, it's a lot easier than when you display an emotion. Sure. Because the link is not obvious. So I would right. I would not succeed in, in in that in that in that exercise or in that uh, because I couldn't communicate it to you unless I titled it how I see orange. Mm -hmm. Right. But you're right. If, if I want to show emotion and I felt like it's it shows, you know, to me, it's it's how I display orange. The, the viewer doesn't have to has, have to see the orange as long as they see the emotion but it defeats the purpose of this exercise. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I guess it yeah. depends on how, um, what we feel the purpose is, I suppose. Um, Anyways, and... let's, um, let's not keep going with this. But... <laughs> no, it's good. It's good to talk about. Um, I wanna grab a couple comments as well. 
this Facebook user said, I love this. I'm working on a personal project involving goodness. Quick survey. What color is goodness to you? Hmm. She's been asking or he, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't tell who this is by just the Facebook name, but thanks. By the way, I've been asking this for about a month. The results surprised me. So what color is goodness? Well, wouldn't it be amazing if I had the word goodness on my little PDF? I'll check. Light blue. That's exactly where I was. I was in like a polar, polar white, right? Which is just a, a very high blue white. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, so light, light blue is freedom, kindness, peace, wisdom, joy. Yeah. That goes along with goodness. Sky blue. Yeah, light blue for me. Yeah. You know, there's there's a guy on TikTok that I follow. He's like color dot nerd or something to that effect. Color, look up color nerd, and all he does is color theory. That's it. And he'll go through everything and how it relates, and um, you know, through beginner level stuff to really complex. Where I'm looking at, I'm like, why do you think about color like this? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So. Like if you're really into color theory, I know there's a lot of people here that really do it. And it's such a science that I'm completely ignorant on. Um, but when I've started to learn about true color theory, it's fascinating. So the emotional stuff, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Emotion's like one aspect of it. But like, it's just so deep and so amazing. So when I see someone like Kelly or Kate or Olga that have this masterful control of color, it fascinates me i just don't know how to do it because i'm like ah, orange blue green you know <laughs> and it's just i'm like you're either happy or sad i just i'm i'm fascinated by this whole thing i could talk about color forever but i think we've wandered off of creativity haven't we <laughs> maybe just a little bit um let's grab a couple comments real quick dennis is with us today hello dennis, hey, dennis. kelly saying orange is my least favorite color it's not my favorite right there with you yeah I don't like it. Uh, Michael saying, once we put something out, isn't it now up to the viewer to interpret it as they want? Like many songs, Deftones, for instance, their songs can be interpreted many different ways. And this is true. And we're actually, I mean, you know, when we go to use our visual literacy skills after we kind of chat a little bit and see some of the amazing images that y'all submitted, we'll be able to see. Um, and much of it depends on how we define success as the creative, right? So that's something that we can talk about as well when we get there. Yes, blue. Goodness is sky blue. Yeah, it's light. It's light and airy. And I think that's why they use um I think that's why they use blue in Mary's um uh, in like the, the Christian iconography of the Virgin Mary. There's a lot of like blue in her in her headdress and stuff. I think that's why they do that. Olga's saying pale yellow. Hmm. Like maybe goldish. Light blues, fair pinks. You're not alone. The last I read the colors that are favored the least are orange and brown. I really like, I actually think I like brown better than orange in general. Mm. Sage green, white, light blue for the win. A green as well, a light green. Huh? I tend, yeah. that's so interesting. Yeah, so light green, light green is growth, harmony, fertility, kindness, compassion, and acceptance. Some favorite What's sky blue, lavender and purple. Huh. Oh, I have that too. <laughs> yeah, um, I like brown better than orange also. So we're not alone there. Can we just, just while well, Becca dips on and off, can we just talk about Kelly's profile picture of just like her frames in that are just phenomenal? I just keep she seeing it pop up and I'm drawn to the frame. Glasses, so. man. Nice job, Kelly. All right. I know. Yeah. All right. Can you guys hear me? Oh, yep. Hey. Oh. Okay, so I had a question, I had a question for Nicole. Now, yeah. here we might get really very convoluted here. So, the use of blue in things like Mary's shawl or head wrap, um, very oftentimes the, the pigment used for that particular blue was incredibly expensive. And so, it was used only on the most holy of figures because they were deserving of that extra cost, right? So, does that in turn then impact all of us many centuries later to feel like this has this goodness association for sure. The opposite. I mean, I would think so. Wouldn't, would you guys think so that that, that iconography yeah, would influence us? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I would think so. How many Mother Mary statues and big statues and mountains are in white and blue, right? Light blue. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I would think so for sure. 
And it's wild. I mean, we know that's why purple is associated with royalty, right? Because the colors that were used to make purple were so expensive to create those dyes. Um, so, of course, yeah, I mean, that that makes sense to me. Olga saying also probably because of the sky. <laughs> and the ocean. Bingo. Yeah. Mary it's also layered. Like there's just it so is. many layers to it and different cultural layers and natural layers and just whether they're instinctual. It's interesting. It is, which is cool, which is a reason why I thought this morning to do that exercise for creativity, it would be great to go with color because we tend to consider it so visual because of course it is visual, but like Bassam was mentioning, there are these, there are these um, abstract ideas associated with color that we have. And for the reason Becca just mentioned, whether that's, you know, our cultural references or things in nature or whatever it is, we have these abstract connections to color. So it makes a really cool creative exercise anytime, you know, that's, that's brought up. And, and I know I've mentioned this before and, you know, most of us that are here, are visual artists of some sort, right? So I think we can make these links pretty clearly, but the the thing that really threw me for a loop in creativity, and I, I've spoken about it here before, is Parker Fister's exercise of just sitting and listening to a piece of music and then writing a story about it, right? Based on what you see. And the same thing with uh, spices that get passed under your nose, right? What, what, what visuals does that bring up? Sounds, taste, touch, texture, like all the things um, are great ways to stimulate other parts of your mind to think about instant stories. You have nothing to write about, no idea what you're going to do for a personal project. Rub some oregano in your hand and, you know, crush it up and smell it and see what images come to mind. Make that, right? There's a lot that can be done very easily. And we often, you know, find ourselves with some level of creative block because we just don't allow ourselves to relax and tune into the different senses. So I love the visual stuff and thinking through how we'd solve these problems. But I also want to touch different things and smell different things and hear different things and see if that creates a totally different story than if I were just able to view it right? View, a, you know, view whatever we're going to see tonight, right? If I could hear the piece of music that goes with it, would I come up with the same type of imagery, right? So I love, I love conversations like these because there's no end, there's no right, there's no wrong. We're all different. I get inspired when I hear somebody else say, here's how I break into my creativity or here's how I would solve that problem. And it fascinates me, right? So I, I, I'm totally rubbing spices with my hands, Kelly. <laughs> um, so uh, <laughs> perfect. Saffron. It's very expensive. You feel very bougie. You <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I just, I love those types of exercises and you doing that this morning just reminded me of all of that. And it was great. Yeah. Um, our English teacher, when I was in middle school was the first time I experienced that. And he had us all close our eyes and he played a piece of classical music and was like, write whatever is in your head. And I, did that to my my oldest son when I was homeschooling him. He was in third grade at the time, fourth grade, third or fourth. And I I played a piece of um, classical music I have on, I just had somewhere. It's actually called Pirate. And it's very much, if you were to hear it, it would bring um, movies like Pirates of the Caribbean and all of that to your mind. It's got the, you know, the strings and it's got the, it just feels like the ocean. So I had him listen to that. And I said, and what did you see in your head? And he was like, sailing ships and you know we, we've gotten so used to that and there are certain sounds that are associated with certain things in a way that they, they can't help but bring those cultural associations to your mind if you've been exposed to them before and we have here in New Mexico rosemary grows like mad I did not know rosemary bushes get as big as you like they're huge and I, I, I walk by I walk by and I'm like this <laughs> There's, it's such an oily plant, but I totally like run my fingers along it and then just walk around smelling the rosemary because it's it's so good. I mean, it does make me want to eat potatoes, but like it's it's oh, if you've never made fried potatoes with garlic rosemary oil, oh, that's oh, what I do. Yeah, yes. yeah. Oh, it's oh, it's the best thing ever. But yeah, get those get those sensations. Um, we're so inundated with visuals all the time that sometimes you're right. We absolutely ignore the other sensations smell and oh here's an interesting thing so there's um a book called the coddling of the american mind i believe that's what it's called and he talks about the fact that our environments are so curated at this point that we we've missed what it's like to actually feel things so 
it's among that group that encourages you to do things like go out and be in the cold for a while without your big warm coat and your all of that stuff. Like just go feel the cold, go, you know, like go do those things and have those experiences and know what it feels like to have your skin tighten up and your, you know, just your cheeks turn pink and all that stuff. And I'm like, man, that's a really good point. We get to a point where we don't know what it's like to be in discomfort anymore. It's, you got to live, you got to have the experience, right? Know what it, know what it feels like to see a sunrise and get blinded by that. Know what it feels like to, you know, do a polar plunge and jump into the ocean and freeze your butt off. Know what, it, know what it's like, you know, all of these different experiences build and build and build and build. But when you're stuck in routines and ruts and comfort, like, yeah, it's great. You're happy, but you're missing out on so much of what's out there, right? That could yeah. contribute to how you create and how you build things. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan. I'm going to, well, it's cold enough here. I don't need to go outside. Yeah, that's what Kelly was just saying. Of course, she's she's up in Canada, so she's along with you, Basam. She's she's yeah. being cold. <laughs> um, yeah, and also there's a, um, a lot of writers, particularly novelists. People like to know what soundtracks we listen to when we write, and oftentimes it really does help. I think um, last week I was having you listen to Wardruna, Matt, um, as a, it's oh, one yeah. of the <gasps> yeah, so good, right? Um, a particular Maybe. song, Helvegan. I, I don't know how to properly pronounce that, so please forgive me if I mispronounced it. But that that particular song, um, when I'm writing the founding trilogy, really helps me get into like the, the mood to write that kind of stuff because it's just viscerally powerful stuff. So fun fact, fun fact, Sicily knows people in that group. Oh, so nice. We've, we've had that conversation. So we're basically, you know, we all know them now. We're just connected yeah. to it. So six what six degrees of separation is that what it is something to that effect moving yeah. on all right so we are near enough on the halfway mark where we'll be able to start pulling up some of the images that we have chosen each member of the panel has chosen an image they felt like just spoke to them and remember this has nothing to do with um you know which image we think is the best quality just the ones that we really felt viscerally connected to and we wanted to take the chance to break them down and explain why they make us feel the way that that they do so um Cicilla, this i was making matt listen to this um last week um uh, when aurora was doing some of the lead vocals for helvega in that song i love it so much i immediately threw on fur and grew braids it was crazy it just happened in an afternoon <laughs> i know you all you want to go out and like fight jotuns <laughs> and you know do things anyway okay so we all went through some of the incredible images using the color red as our March challenge. So all of the images that were submitted this month had the color red as a theme somehow, whether it was a tiny bit or a whole bunch, um, however you felt like you wanted to explore that. And so each of the members chose ones that they felt inspired by. And we're gonna do the same thing we do at every live. We're going to show the images one at a time, take a moment to really take the image in, think about how it makes us feel don't try to analyze it or critique it. Just let it make you feel something. And then once we have a good idea of how that makes us feel, then we're going to start using our visual literacy skills to try and figure out why. Why does the composition contribute to the way you feel? How is the color working? What is the facial expression saying? All of that stuff. Is there rhythm? Is there, you know, weight to certain parts of the image? All that stuff. We're going to look at that and see if we can figure out from a visual literacy standpoint why it makes us feel that way. So I have loaded everything up. Bring it on. on to the Photoshop. Ooh. So we are going to start with the first image that was chosen by the wonderful Nina Covington. So this I saw is this one. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is the first one that was chosen. So we're going to take a minute just to have a look at this one and let us feel something. Oh, and Becca just letting me know that uh, she, Becca recommended, I'm going to mispronounce it. Do you know how to pronounce the name, Becca? Properly, because I don't. <laughs> she doesn't either. Heilung? Heilung? H-E-I-L-U-N-G? It's probably something much more guttural in there. Yes. Oh, yeah. So just, yes. 
very cool. All right, so let's have a look at this beautiful image and think about how it makes us feel. Friends in the audience, put it in the comments. Let us know. When you look at this, how do you feel? Don't try to analyze it or break it down yet. Just what does it make you feel? Yep, I'm good. Bassam is good. Matt is good. Becca, let us know when you have a... Almost there? All right. So our friends in the audience are saying powerful. <laughs> Curious. A reckoning. Fearlessness and power. Urgency. Intensity. I feel unprepared like I am not ready to deal with whatever she is about to make happen um so maybe unprepared isn't quite right but un um there's a word um. not enough where are you thesaurus <laughs> when I need you you know, I felt something very similar. I felt this, this, um, this awe, right? So like, I'm, I'm, I'm in wonder of this mysticism in front of me and I feel less than, right? Inadequate. Inadequate. Thank you. There it is. Right. I don't feel adequate. Um, and yeah, that there is this thing that is more than what I'll ever be in front of me. And yeah, that's the feeling that I got. I don't know how to necessarily describe that, but inadequate is a good way to go. Yeah. Melisandre. Yes, the red lady. I feel, uh, actually, I feel eerie a little bit. Yeah. But at the same time, there's a sense of majesty, majestic. So I'm, I'm trying to, I also need a thesaurus for this, and I've had a similar feeling from several of the images, but like I'm in the, in the presence of power, in the presence mm. of also majesty. Um, I very much feel like, uh, uh, I don't know how to, I don't know the word I want. Um, inadequate. Inadequate's not quite it. And it's, small is not quite it, but. Something is related to luminous, right? Yeah. I, well, I also. An, if an image forces us to look up thesauruses, it's quite <laughs> impactful, isn't it? For yeah. sure. I feel Challenge. orange. I feel orange. <laughs> no, there's a there's a mysticism here, right? There's a um I feel intimidated, Olga says. In, intimidated, another great word. That's right? a good one. That's closer, yeah. yeah. Like a phoenix, like there's an awakening. Love that. Confident. So we've all shared a little bit about how this image just makes us feel. There's a visceral feeling there. Why? So when we look at this, obviously the color red is used very powerfully, but there's a lot of other things going on here that are contributing to the fact that we feel this sense of intimidation or inadequacy or power or whatever it is that we're feeling. So if you shared what it makes you feel, start using some of those visual literacy skills we've been practicing um, and think about things like the composition and the color palette and the lighting and the expression and all of those things that are involved in visual literacy and see if you can start listing why they make you feel that way. And then of course, Trish saying, mother of dragons vibe, strong, but not worried, like worried for what is about to happen. So I said eerie, it gives me an eerie feeling simply because of her eyes, right? Everything else is majestic. It's just that the eyes, the way they pop, the way the eye, the, the light reflects in them, the fact that, you know, when you didn't zoom in, before you zoomed in, you, you could see red inside her eyes. Um, once you zoom in, zoom in, it does obviously reflect the, the, the circle of light, but it, it, it just gives me an eerie feeling simply because of the eyes. You know, 
there's a lot here. I could talk about this image for days. Um, so there's this classical feeling of red with heat, right? And there's this wind in her hair. So there's clearly a hot wind coming from behind her, right? That wind could be supporting her, right? So is she creating it? And this wind is rushing past her towards whatever she's looking at that she's taking on, that she's confronting, right? There's all of these things. And classically for me, red equals danger or red equals, you know, step away from, or it's heat again. But in this, I don't feel danger. I feel like I'm about to watch something spectacular. Mm -hmm. Is that the stuff behind her? Are they planets? Are they ashes? Are they embers? You know, I don't know. But there's this this wonderful security in it as well. Like, I don't necessarily feel the danger that red typically projects for me. Um, I'm feeling in awe again of this, whatever is about to happen, whatever I'm about to observe. Um, there's this majesty behind it. And for me, this this is just, I want to know the story. I want to know what this is all about. Um, but yeah, that's just some of the feelings that I get, this warmth, this not necessarily danger, but not security either. Um, it's just an observation of something that is going to be singular in time and life altering. That makes sense. Yep. And I know for me, a, a big part of why I think there's an intimidation factor here in how I feel when I see this image is because we are from a low viewpoint and we're looking up at her and she's obviously placed very heroically in the frame and the everything beneath her is dark. Like her clothing is dark. There's a lot of weight to the bottom of the image. And so there's a lot of a rising sensation there that I think plays really well into you, what you were mentioning, Matt, with the fact that there's her hair blowing and her clothes moving and these sparks, you know, going all over the place. So um, I really like compositionally how looking up at her like that has really placed us in that sense of inferiority and, and given her kind of a heroism there. And we have some great comments coming in also. Um, so, and that's what Platon does really well, right? Too, he shoots up yeah. angle and makes people feel intimidating or powerful, right? It's just yes. it's the thing that we're used to seeing, yeah. Yes, yeah. So, it seems to me she has her eyes set on something that gives her hope, which I think is in that she's got that almost she's looking at the horizon, right? Like her eyes are not focused close to her, a way out of her situation. She's stoic, being centered puts the focus on her, but her glance out of frame makes me wonder what's coming and how prepared she is. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's a calmness in her face about that. Like I would think, I, I feel like she can handle whatever it is, right? Red being a powerful color, the movement of the hair, the background specs and clothing, like every, all of it is forward motion. Oop. Like she's about to fight a dragon. <laughs> I can see that. Mm. Ooh, That's interesting. Yeah being called but debating whether to respond and then the way she's looking into the horizon Sicilia said the way her hair and clothes are moving it all awakes a feeling of reckoning oh that's a really great word mm -hmm. like the moment before a battle like she's about to raise her arms and summon something that will make the entire difference i can feel that too sharon saying there seems to be destruction going on around her by the orangey flame in the environment yet the expression makes me feel like there's a way out of this so people getting a lot visually of mm. why this is making us have so many feelings. Yeah. It's powerful with so little in the image itself. It's just really powerful. There's so much story that comes out, but there's not a lot to it. It's a woman with some specs around her. Right. And I don't mean to demean it like that, but it's just, there's not a lot to it, but listen to how much we're getting out of it just by expression, just by composition, just by color. Um, there's so much behind this. I, God, this is fascinating. You can imagine a thousand troops behind her. Yeah. 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 Or a thousand troops in front of her. Right. Yeah, yeah that too. Mm -hmm. Becca, how about you? I know this one took you a little while. It wasn't that it took me a little while. I just I couldn't find the word, but you guys covered a lot of what I would have to say already, particularly to our audience out there in their comments. Our audience is geniuses. Good job, guys. Yep, she's about to go to war. Joan of Arc, 2022. Nina, can you come and fight our battles, please? 
if Nina could just walk before me everywhere I went, <laughs> so I would be like, she could go and I could just be in her shadow. I would feel so confident about everything. <laughs> All right, I wanna make sure we have some time to get to the next images. So Nina, this is absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much Gorgeous. for sharing it with us. Really quickly, Cicela saying, I feel if we zoomed out on the scene, we would find her walking across a battlefield full of chaos and seeing everyone moving away from her, giving space as she's like being pulled trance like, yeah, I, I mess up anything. I'd like to speed my seat on the panel to Cicela because she's putting the words to the things that I'm stumbling on. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's really it. It, it's, it it has that battle feel like if i were to describe it like i couldn't put one word to it but i feel like i am the lowly foot soldier looking up at my general or you yes know, my red woman right and she's got her eyes locked on the prize out of frame and i'm terrified and i'm looking up at her as everything's on fire and being destroyed and she's just like nope i got this shit so yeah and I do wonder, so for those of us who are familiar with Game of Thrones and what this is kind of hearkening to, how much do you think we are impacted by recognizing that reference? You know, without 100%. that reference, yeah, like how, and of course, like that's one of the genius things of visual literacy in the first place is you get to draw on these cultural things and say, well, this was really big. A lot of people probably had connection to that. I can pull from that in order to communicate what I want to, which is exactly why I, it's such a powerful a thing for nina i'm curious about what the what is in the background it looks almost skeletal back here yeah let's see if we can whoop let's see is what we can skull? i don't think it really greatly changes the impact but i am i've been looking at it trying to figure out what it is <laughs> it's kind of giving me dead dragon vibes definitely the game of thrones influence there for sure We'll wait to see what Nina says. And in the meantime, we'll go ahead and move on to the next image. This one by Olga Tenyanin. So we're gonna take a, a look at this. Remember friends in the audience, we're just gonna begin by looking and think about how this makes us feel. Don't try to analyze it yet. Just share your feelings. Go ahead if you got it. It's giving me desperation. While I feel like I should be scared, I feel a sense of sympathy and empathy. I feel for the subject and the whatever pain that they're in. Like I just feel this sem the sympathy for for them. I I feel I do feel the horror. I mean if this was a movie, I, I wouldn't watch this movie. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. I love the image. I just wouldn't watch the movie. Yeah. Yep, I sure can. Zooming in. Remember, I'm, I'm, these are downloaded from Facebook, so they aren't always as high quality as I, you know, we could really make things out. But And I'll just plug here. If you go into the Facebook group and you look at this entire series, you'll be amazed. But Absolutely. Yeah, this, this image in particular struck me. Yeah. Trish saying creepy, Kelly saying possession. <laughs> And Nina, we won't be watching movies together because I don't like horror movies. Nina would love to watch, would watch that movie. Yeah, I feel when I look at this, I have this sense of growing horror. Like, mm. I feel like she is about to do something I'm going to wish she wouldn't have done. I mean, it took me not a long time, but I, I was wondering, is is that her hand or somebody else's hand? <laughs> I mean, it's obviously her hand. 
Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it, is, no, it is her hand, but my first look at it, it's as if, like, what is she looking at? Somebody's hand sticking out of a rock. Oh, sure. Yeah, I feel like she is like it's climbing like up an is... altar. Like, she's about to, like, something is being asked of her, and she doesn't quite have the power to give it, and yet she's going to claw her way toward that thing and give whatever she can. I see That's so what much I'm at, too, like, you know, like the scene at the end of the movie where the villain has like almost yeah. eradicated our heroes and then they, they're doing their giant magic spell to like summon the minions of hell, but then they've messed up the spell or something and then they start to wither away at the altar. That's what I'm getting here. I just oh. see so much pain. There's just so much. I, I just keep coming back to that, like this poor creature. You know, I, I feel this this sense of sympathy and and for whatever pain she's in you know i don't necessarily feel a danger or an evil or anything like that just kind of like oh this sucks oh i definitely i have a sense of foreboding like mm. like she is not she has been lied to <laughs> she is doing something she should not be doing um and i think so let's let's start using some of these visual literacies now that we've had a look Somebody else thought it was a different hand. Sharon mentioned subservience. Kelly was saying she's distraught. She's been taken advantage of. She's mm -hmm. all disheveled and dirty. Um, and if we start using some of those visual literacy skills to break down why this image is making us feel the way it is, Kelly's got a couple great things right away. The white dress makes me feel pureness. And as we move up, she's distraught. She's in pain. So maybe innocence stolen. And I, I was right there, Kelly. I was thinking that white dress immediately makes me think of virgin sacrifices, right? Or like there's a, a purity that must be sacrificed in order for whatever is about to happen to happen. And that sense of red, of course, hearkening to blood. And then, you know, the black that's around her eyes makes me think she's been part of some kind of ceremony um, because, of course, now she's crawling up this altar as well. So I think there's a lot of really cool ways that you could interpret something like this, even um, from the fact that this is a woman, there is a, a real, there is a real sense of when you're moving into womanhood. I mean, the, the first thing that makes you a woman is the shedding of blood, right? So there's, there's something in there that's ceremonial also. So it kind of makes me feel like that. Can we talk about this though? Oh, I'm sorry, Matt, go ahead. I was going to say, can you zoom in? I don't know if it's an infinity stone or a bird skeleton, or I don't know what that is. It's rocks. Okay. Got it. Yeah, Couldn't it, tell what that was. It's, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, what's the significance of that? It's relatively benign compared to the expression on her face or... the type of raw devotion where you'll do anything you're asked, hence ecstatic devotion. She's given her eyes to summon her God, the red moon indicating the summoning. Yeah, so this light, this the, the use of the red in particular here is really interesting to me because it's obviously, it's it's coming from above. It's implication it could be like the moon, like Cicel is suggesting, but it's so wildly unnatural. It's not like the previous image where that could have felt like fire. It has that warmth, it has sparks. Like this is something very ominous this is not a kind of light that you get on a beautiful moonlit night or a nice sunny day like it's very particular and unnatural in the particular shade of red and how it's coming down on the subject it's interesting yeah agreed and then of course there's there's other visual literacy things happening here as well i mean she's on the ground right and so that by itself is symbolic of a whole bunch of things whether it is weakness or subservience or desperation like there's several different things that crawling across the ground relates to and then even her body language there it, i mean if you look at the shape of her hand there's there's desperation in that and there's a bentness to everything there isn't a lovely pretty flow it's very much strained um and i love the i love the use of shadow here right where you've got this bright red light but most of her face and body is in is in this shadow so um i love the the juxtaposition of that where everything else seems to be bright but her face is dark um and that just adds to this ominous 
feel of pain and destruction and all of that, like vengeance to come, whatever it might be. Um, but I love the the not only the shadow on her face, but the use of the shadows in the forest or the cave or whatever it is behind um, that separates out this foreground from the background. I really love the depth of this, right? Yeah. You really feel like you're up close and that there's this vastness that's behind her. I just, I don't know. It, it yeah, struck I, me when I totally I agree, and, I, and I, I, I appreciate the depth, but also the color, that greenish. Yeah. There's a little tint of green there. It just, it just beautiful Compliment. color tones, yeah. Yeah. They're standing stones. So this isn't a reproduction of Stonehenge that is built in the in the gorge, the right on the Columbia River that separates Oregon and Washington. Oh, it's a neat place if you ever get the chance to go. But um, in some of the other images in the series, Matt, you were mentioning earlier, if you go look, you can see more of the standing yeah. stones. And yep. um, yeah, so it was built, Olga mentioning, it was built as a World War II memorial, but it's, gotcha. it's that reproduction of Stonehenge. So super cool. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's. They're trying to find Jamie. Outlander fans unite. Okay, so yeah. obviously, super, maybe, super. Maybe maybe this last last comment we, we talked about, you know, crawling on the ground. But can you see her being pulled away? We can't, we can't see her legs, oh, but she's actually being me... pulled away from whatever, whatever I... it is on the left side of the. the maybe frame. somebody got a hold of her ankle, huh? Ah, just thought. Of could be whoops all right so thank you olga for this gorgeous image we got to continue moving along we're going to grab this shot from win our friend win and becca chose this one so let's give ourselves a couple minutes just to take in how it makes us feel you guys know the drill by now and when we have something go ahead and put that in the comments let us know when you see this image how does it make you feel you do some zoom in. Yeah, I sure can. Whoops. Okay. This is dope. I am ready whenever you guys are. So what do you think? How is it making you feel? This is also giving me that that nameless feeling of being in a presence but uh let's go with the intimidation word because that seems to fit kind of best like i am uncomfortable and a little bit afraid and it's awesome there's um there is almost something of gothic horror about this isn't there like there's a a richness and a lusciousness and a and a, nina said the great word decadence there's a decadence to it but at the same time also a danger I mean, I, I love that they included thorns in this dress because mm -hmm. there's is something American horror story and gothic horror about it that just makes me feel like, I don't even know the right word to. It, there's also the cultish feeling around it. I don't know, the triangle of the roses. It looks like it's a candelabra. Like a, like a cult, like a cult figure even. Mm. Olga saying living in a gilded cage Kelly saying it actually makes me feel sad she's gorgeous on the outside but she's been hurt and won't let others in the, there were two things that I felt immediately one was all love is pain mm. and which I was that's a, that's a whole different therapy session um, <laughs> but 
the other thing that the other image that popped in my mind was from the Dark Tower series, right? This one rose at the center of the world sort of thing, this one tower at the center of the world. And I don't know, for some reason, it just struck me the 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 cylindrical feature of it. Um, and yeah, there is this again, maybe I'm on some mysticism kick tonight, but um, there's this otherworldly aspect to it because um, I don't see a lot of people with roses as heads. So maybe that's contributing to it um i love this image so much there is such a delicacy to it yet there's such a strength in those thorns and the confident posture i just so many emotions in this for such a simple image there's a comment down there that i like did we get to it yet no i'm heading towards oh wait i'm heading oh, wait. Yeah. Be our no guest. holding back. I know. I mentioned the candelabra. And now she's got Lumiere. Tom that said one. an offering. That. An offering, Becca? A little bit. Like, it's not really like Alice in Wonderland, Red Queen, but I feel like I am being invited or against my will mm. or offered something. That's the cultish feeling I got. Yeah. Yeah. You know what's throwing me off, what's making me feel that way? It's the actual vignette that's kind of ruining it for me. Because if you take away that vignette and just keep the bright red across the whole image, I would feel more like Matt, Matt feels about it. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, just having that kind of weird looking vignette. Um, I think the, the vignette's, yeah, the vignette's a little strong, but I think it's needed to, to, to bring you in to the subject, uh, right? Um, I, yeah, I'm with Matt there. Like, it doesn't really feel like an ordinary photograph. Like, it almost has this like mixed media kind of feel to it. Like, it could yeah. be collage or even partially painted. Or I feel like this is a tarot card that if somebody gave yeah. me, it take something from me, right? Like, yeah. they oh, give it to me, shit, and the got voodoo that. guy got me. Like, <laughs> that's what's gonna happen. Bang, man, again. That's what's going to happen. Of course, it could be as simple as somebody auditioning for the masked singer. <laughs> it's just, there's, it's overripe. Everything about it is overripe, mm. right? Like, it's the, the overripe lushness that is, will kill you. I mean, you, you're going to go embrace her and get the shit poked out of you with those thorns. Like, I just... So let's start pulling some of these visual literacy skills out. Um, obviously, we have the figure and a gorgeous dress of a beautiful woman. We have these roses, which are symbols of beauty, love, and romance. We're using the color red, which is the color of passion and power and love and romance. But we also have these thorns. We have roses where they shouldn't be, the size that they shouldn't be. So like symbolically, there's a lot happening um, and the positioning and then the treatment of the image also very much is um, objectifying and not in like, not in the way of like, here's an object for my desire, but meaning that this is an object and not just a person. This is something mm -hmm. beyond, it's, it's almost moving into like iconoclastic territory, right? Like whether it was intentional or not, um, and I assume it's intentional because Wynn is extraordinarily thoughtful. Um, but the use of the glitter and the white that really stands out, that brings you to certain parts of the image, right? You're focused on this glitter around the head, but you're also drawn to little specks at the bottom of the dress or on the arm or right over the heart, right? So I'm wondering if those were used to draw you into certain places to observe other details. Or if they were just kind of like, oh, yeah, there's some glitter and she, you know, works nights. Um, <laughs> but, but there was a lot here. I just kept coming back to those bright spots and wondering why they were there. Because they're random and they could easily not be in the image and it would still be incredibly powerful. But I like the use of it to break it up. It gives it this certain, um, uh, I don't, delicacy is not the word, extravagant. Maybe mm. is the word that I was looking for. Like sure. it up levels it a little bit. Um, so yeah, I just, I wanted to see those a little bit more closely. Thank you. 
Yeah, for sure. So Siri here has an observation that I actually wanted to mention too. What's your observation? She always sleeping and she has no eyes. She has no eyes, which makes, that makes it so much creepier, right? It's not even just that the eyes are in shadow or something. It's this literal removal of the human face. And it's so uncomfortable and it's used really well here. I mean, something you can use in all sorts of creative ways when disconnecting, you know, from your audience. And I really like how it's used here with replacing the entire head. It's fascinating. And it pleases a five-year-old. So, you know, cool. Yep. I am with you, Siri. There's any time you remove a face and have a human figure, there's an uncanniness to it that happens that takes something into the danger territory. <laughs> Kelly's saying, I'm less inclined to push myself into the mystical aspect. I feel more centered on the idea of feeling the need to be beautiful, like her femininity mm -hmm. is being used against her and is hardening her to real affection and love. And mm -hmm. then add the intensity of all the red. Red upon red upon red upon red. Again, another gorgeous image. I know, I know. And I I wish we could stay with much of them for longer, but we got to get through some more. So Wynn, that was incredible. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. This image by Paul Martin. It's bananas. A chance to have a look at this shot. So remember, we just want to feel first. So have a look at this. Let it impact you. Hmm. I am ready. Speaking of feeling inadequate when you look at an image, like, good Lord, this is gorgeous. <laughs> I'm ready to. I'm zooming, guys. I'm zooming. Getting a little bit closer here. Yeah, this is gorgeous. I feel loss and isolation. Alone and exposed. Siri's got something. How do you feel, Siri? I actually like that there's like better on the flat. On <laughs> like the back. It does look like feathers. Loss was my word too. I like that there's feathers too, Siri. Like so we've got that it's powerful. Letting go of hurt, Kelly says. I feel strength and protection, actually. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I, I definitely have a sense of loss. Wanting mm. a metamorphosis, huh? Kelvin saying alone or lonely. Braving the storm, finding strength. Mm. Yes, it's so expansive. She's freeing herself from something. Maybe she's lost her wings. Kelly saying pain. Nina may be feeling a little bit like Bassam, like maybe she's bringing the storm. Tom's saying, can't find the right word, but the feeling of being sad that you can't go back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a kind of melancholy almost, huh? <laughs> I'm only using the term kung food from now on. 
You know, it's the it's the body position that really throws me on this, right? So the the red is so striking against all the the blues and browns and neutrals, but the body position, it's interesting how I'm interpreting it versus how other people are interpreting it. And I think that's the fascinating part of this. Um, so I love seeing how people are pulling up, you know, strength or bringing in that power. And immediately I'm thinking that collapsed figure is shielding herself or in pain or, you know, there's a sense of loss or something there. So I don't know if it's the expression on her face or the body position, but it could also be the moment before she explodes into something magnificent. So it's a it's a wonderful body position to be in, especially teetering on the edge, because the story can go in so many different directions. Um, I find I this fascinating. I think you just touched on one of the really important things. So, of course, now we're obviously getting into um, these aspects of visual literacy and why this image is making us feel that way. But there's a few things that are happening here. And I think you touched on an important one, Matt. If you notice, she is right on the edge of this dune. She is between literally standing at the edge of earth and sky of sunlight and shadow. And she is in the shadow. So, you know, the mountain back here is picking up some sun. The other dunes where they go into the grasslands are starting to pick up some sun. She is in the shadow. She is beneath storm clouds. Her body posture is inherently self-protective. If, if your stomach hurts, if you've been hurt, if you've, if you've been emotionally hurt, this is what you do. You protect your vulnerable parts. You protect your heart. You protect your stomach. You hunch in on yourself. Also, the wind is coming from behind her. Her hair is blowing across her face. She's almost being swallowed up by her dress. So all of those particular things are definitely, for me, why this feels so much. I think, you know, Sharon has has got some of it there with the idea that of regret, right? Um, and, and Tom of kind of that feeling of wishing that you could go back but also being at the precipice of something this, maybe this is her day in her days in the desert, right? Like we know that this is what you go through before you come out the other side. It's kind of that Moses in the desert thing. Siri has a thought over there. What is your thought, Siri? I actually have something to say about the guy. Okay. It's actually like it's starting to storm. It is. Way crowned. You are right. It is like it's starting to storm. So we, we got a comment earlier about the isolation and my, my first, you know, first impression was, was that loss and it, it kind of feels like heartbreak to me, mm -hmm. you know, bringing in that red and that just being dolled up and beautiful, but in pain and alone into somewhere that looks dangerous and miserable and it doesn't have anything to offer you, but you're going anyway. You see, I said, the landscape, I think, is very impactful here. Like, this would not yeah. feel the same in, in a, a different forest. environment. Yeah. Mm. You see, for, for all the same reasons that you're seeing, you're seeing what you're, you know, what you've described. That's where the, I see it all as strength. I mean, this this image has so much. When you really look at it, there's a lot of movement in it. Yet it seems frozen in time. There's nothing that's going to push her off that ledge, right? Sure. She yeah, is definitely. there. She's going to protect whatever she wants to, she needs to protect in that position. And she is in a position of strength. I cannot see her falling off that. That's, that's what I see when I see that, that picture. Yes, you can interpret it many different ways, but I'm just saying why I see strength there. The way she's, you know, the protect, you know, she's the way she's holding her arms, you know, that's protecting something, right? Uh, we don't know if she's protecting her baby in there. I don't know. Uh, there's there's just enough enough dress. There's enough fabric there that there could be somebody something or somebody in there. Yeah, there I mean, could be a whole person in that fabric. Hey, no, we're gonna mute. <laughs> sorry, yeah. don't be sorry. I love it. Yeah, but I love the color palette and, and especially especially the the saturation level on the red. The way it blending up. It's it's if it was if it was too saturated, it just would not be the same image. I mean, yeah, it blends, it blends really, really well with that background. Agreed. There's the 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 lines of the dunes and the mountain give me this sense of falling downhill, right? And I think that's really why, with her on the edge, there's this 
down angle of everything with her curved back. And it just feels like there's this movement to sweep her off the edge, which is where I felt that. To, to Bassam's point, she could very well be leaning into that and pushing against that exact force. But it's just, that's the feeling that I got like, oh shit, she's about to go. You know, so um, it's those lines that really brought me into it. Well, I think oh, that- question. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm <laughs> juggling my life. Um, so question, Matt, on that, because I'm, I'm with Bassam too, where I do feel like she's, she's moving forward. I don't feel like she's gonna fall back. And I wonder if the position in the frame here is really kind of pushing that she's coming more towards the viewer versus if she were to teeter off the edge, would that be implied more strongly, say, if we saw her from behind well, and got that sense of, of, you know, distance or something that she would actually fall? Because I feel like she is moving forward, yeah. whatever painful, awful thing or stormy sky she's oh. running from, but she's still going. And for, for me, it's the opposite. I see her center of gravity as behind her, right? And she's leaning forward, trying not to go back. Um, and it's just, it's thinking what the, the body does. But I totally see she could very well be leaning into the wind, Be but the wind is coming a different direction. It's blowing her dress forward. She seems to be leaning back. It's just the center of gravity thing that's that's kind of throwing me off. Um, but I'm sure that if we were to look from a different direction, it might tell a completely different story. You're right. Yeah, I think, and I can see what you're saying, Bassam. So I definitely feel a lot of pain and loneliness in this image, but the fact that she hasn't fallen, right? Like she's still standing and certainly there's strength in that. Okay, I wish we had more time. We have already gone past our hour, so I want to make sure we say thank you to Paul for sharing this, and we will get to the last image. Beautiful image, Paul. The last shot that we're going to share today, this by Claudia. So Claudia shared this one. This was one that I picked because I could not stop coming back to look at this shot. Um, so let's take a moment, let it make us feel something, and then we'll share... Our feelings. Hmm. I know how I feel. Yeah, me too. Becca feeling like she's got it. Siri knows how she feels. It's great, Becca. We are helping her grow her artisticness. <laughs> I already know she's an artist, so. I feel hopeful when I see this image. It makes me hopeful. Siri feels some kind of way. How do you feel, Siri? And why is so many clothes black? I don't know. That's a good what question. Mine? I, I feel curious. I feel like there's there's learning or something going on here. So I'm gonna, I've been asked to zoom in, so we'll go through. I feel this innocence and contentedness. I just feel content looking at this. There's also a sense of isolation. Mm -hmm. Oh, huh. high five. <laughs> so we've had lonely, curious, content. I feel hopeful. I'll explain. I'll explain later why it makes me feel that way. Solemnity, right? Mm. So there's this. I don't know that that just kind of keeps popping into my head as well. I know that there's a lot of things happening in this image from just a visual standpoint that I'm excited to get into because it just sparks so many of my my interested wonder and eagerness yeah. quiet content lost in her own world kelly saying magical mm. 
So let's see if we can start using some of our visual literacy skills and figuring out what it is visually, what's included in this image that makes us feel that way. So Kelly picking up on one of my things as well, all the lines leading to the bookshelf. That is one of the things I really love about the way that this shot is composed. Nicole, can you zoom in on the top of the bookshelf? Like what, yep. just on the objects, all the bags and the... Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've got, looks like maybe some kind of a bag, some different folded fabric, some books here. And then of course, these books are in cloth sacks. So in all of these different beautiful patterns, these, so these are all books that are protected by these cloths. And then of course, these stacks. And here is our little figure doing a bit of reading. Cute little toe beans tucked up underneath. Would love to know what she's reading to have stopped her in her tracks like that. Can you tell what language that is? It looks like... Zoom in. Was it music? No, it's no. hard to see. It looks a little like Arabic, um, but I, I wouldn't know enough to be able to say anything with any kind of confidence. Maybe well, it's definitely, uh, definitely right to the left, so Arabic is a possibility. Yeah. Is that Comic Sans? <laughs> Um, so for me, I love the use and the treatment of this image because we've got these very kind of brick worn reds. There's a lot of texture here. We have, of course, the reds that are in this rug. We have the reds in her pattern, but then the red of, of her shawl is so saturated and so bright and it really holds you there. And the fact that she's turned away from us, she could be any little girl who ever wanted to learn or read or get lost in a book. And in a real way, she is sitting before the altar of knowledge, right? Like, I was this girl with a book in my hand and I, I see this image from a place in a different place in the world that has a different everything and I'm still her in my head. The, the texture in the walls, the dirt in the rug, the texture on the, the marble, right? Makes me feel like this place that she's in is a little bit dusty and dirty and old. And the books on the bottom shelf specifically are tattered and worn but that red that she's wearing and even the bottom of her foot is a little bit dirty but the red that she's wearing gives this cleanliness this yeah. innocence to it and she's in this world of her own reading right and it just it's this wonderful beautiful little bubble amidst all of this other stuff and i can almost hear noise or chaos or other kids or something going on in the background but like I was as a little kid, just sitting there tuning the world out, just reading over and over and over and over. And that's exactly where I'm transported here. And I think that red just pulls you right into that bubble. And you forget about all the muted tones because it's so saturated right there at the person's head. Um, I, I absolutely am blown away by this, by this image. And red being a color of power over her head, where knowledge is at. <laughs> this is a big main character energy is what this is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I didn't see this one in the group. And so this is really interesting seeing it for the first time. I was trying to find it Ooh. just now in the Sorry, group. Sorry, guys. Too. Um, one thing that's interesting also that kind of lends itself to that narrative is the fact that we're seeing a door frame like we're seeing a hallway or something there's there's more in this space it's not just a bookshelf in a room there's right there's bigger well, I, mean, I, I, I see it as a school and the, the other like where are the other girls right and uh, that's why i said isolation it's all positive isolation it's just she's what i mean by positive she's exactly what nicole described yeah. But I could see all the other girls doing all kinds of other things and they're not interested in books and not interested in reading and they want to play and they want to play hopscotch. Totally. Right. Mm. Kelly saying this is, you know, she she turns into Melisandre like she's the one who's going to go out and be able to fight the dragon. She probably is in her head right now. Like that's probably what she's doing is 
going off to fight dragons and reading a book and learning that you can fight a dragon even when you're a small person. I love this image so much. Yeah, it's for gorgeous. the patterns, for the lines, for the placement of the girl within the image, for the color, the way the color red is used there, for the way that she's kneeling in front of this bookshelf and reading. There just is so much I love about this. And, and I love you mentioned, Matt, the fact that, you know, she's in a location that, I mean, she's surrounded by marble and, and some kind of really something that you feel like could be a really beautiful place. Um, mm -hmm. and, and here she is with her dirty little feet in front of a book and you know the the interesting thing too as i keep looking at it too the the brightest spots are along the bottom and along the left edge right where there's some sunlight coming in and she's found this little quiet respite amidst the shadow maybe it's a little bit cooler than where she normally is and she's finding this little bit of comfort in this cool corner um i just kind of keep looking at that like she's carved out this little spot in the room for herself um yeah it's man it's there's so much here Olga mentioning also that culturally, the fact that this is a little girl reading, there's so many places in the world. Um, right. We are assuming that this is a girl, particularly because of the head wrap, I think, but right. And for floral clothing, but um, there are so many places in the world where little girls don't have access to the ability to do this. And there's so much power in that and hope in that. And that's so much why this image makes me feel hopeful when I look at it. Yeah, it's gorgeous. I love it. I love it. I wish we could stay on and say more things about it. Claudia, this one was my favorite of all the gorgeous images that she took um, because it just obviously, as an author, it spoke to me so stinking much. I was just like, yes, this, this shot. Um, let me go ahead and stop the screen share here. Those images crushed tonight. They were oh, incredible. Oh my God. Guys, the, the group was so... It, First, let me say it was really hard for us to choose, right? Like we we didn't we weren't just like, oh yeah, there are some some clear ones here that uh, are, we're gonna see. Like it, there was so much good stuff. I feel, I wish that we could have looked at all of them and broke them down together because I'm sure that there are things you guys would have seen in them that I didn't completely see or that the audience would have picked up where I would have seen them with entirely new eyes. But I'm really grateful that we got the chance to see what we did and break those down because they were so fun to look at. And, you know, when mentioned, um, when we responded in the group to that image, he was like, I wish the, the PPA judges would have liked it that much, you know? And I think that just goes to show that there's a difference between enjoying an image for what it gives you and scoring an image based on how close somebody got to your objective standards mm -hmm. and when we do this exercise together we're not going well it's 10 for composition and 10 for this and 10 for that we're going well how does it make us feel and why and some are going to hit us in the guts and some are going to be like well that's cool but you know it's, it's it doesn't get me too much and that's what art is supposed to do that's why i love these exercises so much because we we get to dispense with the act of of formal critique, right, of saying, does this hit the mark or does it not? And just say, from an emotional standpoint, from a connection standpoint, why? I love it. This was a <laughs> lot of fun. It's a perfectly sellable image. I'd give it an 83. <laughs> <laughs> That's silver. This is, this is exactly why I have to walk. I had to walk out when I was at WPPI. I happened to walk into a room because I was curious what the judging would be like. I went in there. I think, well, was Olga, were you with me? Were you with me for that one? I went in there and then I was just like, nope. <laughs> just turn around and go because I was just going to get mad. Tom saying, this was fun. Everyone has such great contributions. Looking forward to next time. Yes. Yes. Me too. Always. Yep. It was Olga. <laughs> it's like, nope, not doing it. Can't just get mad. Um, all right, y'all. So any final thoughts, friends, before we head out for tonight? I know we went over a little bit, but I don't mind because it was so good. Yeah. I want to know what's next month. Yeah. And how we're going to do it. Yeah. Perfect. All right, y'all. So I told you we were going to get into how these challenges are going to change. So here is what we're going to do. We wanted to be able to celebrate you guys a little bit more than just sharing an image and talking about how it made us feel. So we thought we would love to 
take the image that we feel the most connected to, share that in our blog, write a blog post about you. Matt's going to do an interview, an interview with you um, for our podcast. And we're just going to share you all over the place. And your image is going to become the banner image for the group for that month. So the way that we want this to work, the only way that really makes sense is we're going to give everybody the challenge. And then that is going to be a post reply in that post with your image, one image. Um, I wish we could do a million, but one. And then it's going to be the job of everybody in the community to go and just like the image that they feel like really connects to them. Once you've done that, we will pick the top five that have the highest amount of likes. We will grab those and those ones we will discuss in our normal live at the end of the month where we do that. And the one that we feel like really just communicates the best. We're going to take that one and celebrate you as an artist, put that image as the heading, get the blog post about you, interview you, just really talk you up and, and, and celebrate the work that you made. So remember, this is not a question of like best, right? This is a question of what people just feel connected to. And that is a matter of taste, not a matter of whether you're a good artist. It just has to do with what people connect to. So that's our way of being able to celebrate you guys and the amazing work that you create. And we're gonna go ahead and give you next month's challenge now, which is love. Love. It's a big one and it's up to you to interpret. There's a million different ways that we could look at it. Love. That is the challenge. We think creatively, right? So like we did in our exercise this morning, it doesn't have to be, here's two people kissing. It could be, well, what does love feel like when it hurts? What does it look like when it's past? What does it feel like when it hasn't happened yet, but you're hoping it does? There's a lot of different ways that you could get creative with this idea. So don't What's be scared. <laughs> That's like, oh God. No, I was like, it looks like me. <laughs> We're going to go out on a ledge. Right, Olga. Oh, love. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> so easy. But that's what we are going to do. So that is the April challenge is love. Make something or grab something from your coffers if you've already taken an image or you've created a sculpture or whatever it is that really signifies that. I will make a post in our Facebook group. Go and comment and share it there. And also feel free to share those things on places like Instagram and use the hashtag TAF April challenge. Or after that, it'll be May challenge, TAF May challenge. Um, and we'll, we'll share and reshare those on Instagram. We'll just try to get as wide a distribution for your images as we can. So yes, the fun. Um, Kelly, yes, that will be so great. Also, we love your face too. <laughs> Um, yes, it looks like everybody's looking forward to, yeah, everybody's looking forward to it because it's going to be awesome. All right, y'all. So thank you so much for being part of today's live stream. We loved having you guys and hearing your thoughts. If you know somebody who should be here with us chatting and doing visual literacy stuff, talking about creativity, let them know that we're here. Of course, you can reshare this live stream because it has been live. It's it's there now. Other people can watch it. So let them know. Also, don't forget, go make an image or a painting or a sculpture or whatever it is that you do with love. Take a picture of it. Post it. Um, tell everybody. Tell everybody. And then be with us tomorrow morning for the last live pod. Well, so call it live podcast, but for the last live show of the week tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, 6 a.m. for the West Coast and 9 a.m. for the East Coast. Or you can always catch the podcast as they post on theartistforge.com or head to our clubhouse club, The Artist Forge, and find the replays there. You can listen to them there also. So come and be with us. Thanks for being here. Y'all are amazing. We love our community. But we're going to see you tomorrow. So bye, friends. See y'all later. Bye-bye.